please welcome writer and director Jeff Baina and producer Michael Zagan. And I hear Golden Globe winner Michael Zagan. Congratulations, guys. All right. Uh, we can be awkward uh, just like some of the scenes in your film. Um, I say that as a compliment, of course. Um, so what struck me um, watching the film this time is just um, all these kind of shifts of energy throughout the film. We have some moments where we have, you know, really funny, broad comedy. Then we get very serious. We get very deep. Then we go to comedy again. Um, what's your approach to writing in that style and directing your actors in that style? Um, for me, it's never really about like finding the genre. So it's never like we're making a comedy, so everything has to be funny all the time. Um, I mean, for me, this is actually more of a drama that has funny moments. So I guess it qualifies as a comedy. But as long as it sort of felt grounded and real, I mean, everything... I mean, these guys are avoiding their emotions. And so the whole movie is sort of we're bracing ourselves for the whole shit to like hit the fan. And, um, yeah, so, like, you're sort of following that trajectory instead of just, I, mean, I don't know, I like tonal shifts. I feel like that's sort of, like, what's really happening in life. You're never really just, like, in a genre or a tone. So, I guess so. And um, the whole idea of kind of suppressed emotions and what can we talk about and what situation, was that, were those themes that you had been wanting to address for a while? Like, where did the story come from for you? Um, I mean, the story is based on some some real events. Um, I, Adam Pally, who plays Ari in it, uh, and I play basketball every weekend, and he had a bachelor party that would have been a bachelor party situation lined up in an upcoming weekend. That's why he wasn't going to be able to go the next weekend to play basketball. And it's, I mean, it's not identical, but there's a lot of overlap between this and that. And he told me that story, and I was like, man, that's like insane. You got to keep me posted because I can't believe what you're walking into. And then afterwards, he kind of told me what happened on that weekend, and it was sort of the genesis of this, and I was like, I have to make this movie. And then, um, I think that was in, like, in 2012, and Zakin, who's one of my closer friends, uh, he, he runs American Zoetrope, uh, the Coppola company, and um, he, like, came up with some scheme where he can get us some money, and, like, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so we were going to make that movie, and then Pally's mom passed away. So we kind of put a, we, we had to walk away from it for a while, and then, but we had a tax credit, I and mean, this is like not an interesting story. We had a tax credit, and so then um, Zakin's like, well, do we have anything else we can do in the interim? And I was like, well, I wrote this script in 2003, so we did Life After Beth like, at the drop of a hat, because we just had the tax credit. But this would have been that. So this movie was supposed to happen a while back, and then it, we kind of came back to it. So did anything change in the writing when you came back to it? I mean, it was a concept. We, th this movie is, uh, it's, it's, it's based off of a treatment, so it's not an actual script. So the dialogue isn't written, so it's mostly improvised. The story was beaded out completely, but, and a lot of what people were saying was beaded out, but it was, it was the actors speaking from their own voice. So um, the main thing that changed was at that time when we, when we were first gonna make it, we went out to uh, this Palm Springs house that Zotrop has, or Roman has, or whoever, and at that time, it was gonna be, the Middle Ditch character was gonna be Chris Pratt, so he came out, and the, the Quill character was Jake Johnson, who is in it, in the hot tub scene, and Pally was Pally, and so it was a totally different, it would have a completely different vibe. Ben Schwartz. So, oh yeah, and Ben Schwartz was gonna be the Alex Ross Perry part. Yeah, I was wondering if you had written the roles specifically for these actors, but it sounds like it all changed. Yeah, I mean, I did ultimately, like I, you know, I, when you don't have a script, you can make a lot of adjustments, so I was able to kind of make adjustments on the fly, like, and tailor it to each character. So, uh, Michael, tell us about um, what are the challenges for you to produce a film that's this low budget and that is very improvisational and free-flowing? Uh, for me, nothing really. You know, um, we had a, a co-producer of ours, this woman, Liz Destro, who sort of came up in this super low budget world, and that's not a world I know much about. So she really ran the show as far as budget and schedule, keeping it super thrifty. And then just knowing Jeff so well and trusting that he would be able to find everything when he needed it and trust those actors, you know, and it was, it seemed to work. And can you talk a little bit about kind of your directing style? You said that you allowed for improvisation and that it was a loose script. Um, you know, how do you, how do you work with each actor? Do you approach them all differently? Are, are some of their kind of natural personalities coming out or are they playing 
um, completely different people than who they are in their personal lives. I mean, all, I, I sort of crafted the story, I mean, whether they knew it or not, a lot based on who they are in real life. I know, I know most of these people really well. And so it was, you know, obviously it's an abstraction uh, and sort of a refinement, but ultimately it's coming from more of an authentic place as opposed to me just like imposing it on them. So it wasn't, I mean, directing them was making it feel grounded. I think when you have this many funny people, um, this many funny people together, it just becomes like a bit fest. So if anything, it was sort of toning down the comedy and, you know, trying to find those moments, like instead of finding every line is a button, so you can, a button's like when it's like the last line that you can kind of cut off. So it just feels a little bit more, I guess, contingent as opposed to uh, less intentional. And I mean, everyone, you know, like Brett Gelman, for instance, is an amazing actor. He's not just like a funny guy. He's like an insane, to me, he's like a John C. Riley kind of guy. And so it's just, you know, someone like that you treat differently than, you know, like Lauren Weedman, who is the, the woman who plays the prostitute at the end, who is like literally one of the funniest people in the universe. Like, I just always want to work with her for the rest of my life. You treat everyone differently, but the way we did it was we just do like three or four takes. And then when we find it and sort of like a master or a wider shot, we'd lock in and kind of get coverage on it. I and mean, we shot it with one camera, so we weren't doing cross coverage or anything, so. And uh, tell people about uh, maybe Alex Ross Perry if they're not familiar with him. I feel like he's, uh, he kind of steals the show in many scenes. So, um, Al so Joe Swanberg, the guy who shows up with his wife and kid, and Chris, that's his wife, and Jude is his son, is like one of my closest friends also, and it's not a competition. And we, um, we, he, he took me to dinner one time and I met Alex, who I thought was such an amazing character. Like, he's literally that guy. And so we became close friends. Every time he'd come to LA, he'd come stay with me and we'd play board games and, you know, we'd play Scrabble and stuff. And just talking to him, I was just like, I, if I can get this guy to just sort of be himself and be comfortable and not so self-conscious, like, while we're shooting, like, it'll be great. I actually had never seen any of his movies or if he's been in, he was in one of his movies called The Color Wheel, which... I haven't seen still, so I, I can't recommend it, but I'm sure it's great. But he's, he's like such a character and he's so amazing. And it was, you know, when we started shooting, I think it was like the, even the first day that we had him, the guy, these guys, like they're all UCB trained improviser, genius comedians, were just like in awe of his like acerbic wit. So it was, I mean, it was just pretty much making sure he wasn't self-conscious. All right, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll have uh, a microphone come over to you. In the back there. Oh, and while we're doing this, uh, Aubrey Plaza was supposed to join us tonight, but I'm sorry, she couldn't make it. She was, she got a movie in between when we said she was coming and now, so she couldn't show up. So if this is like a super bummer, I'm sorry. But I know you guys were like, let's hear the director. But uh, we got Zakin, so that's a coup. Check this out. Bam. Is <laughs> <laughs> uh, this mic on? Yeah, go ahead. They don't have hello, a mic. hello, 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 hello. There we go. Uh, impressive muscles. Um, the you mentioned that it was a, sort of a loose script, mostly improvised. I was wondering um, that the high emotional scene with Paul Reiser and the and the wife and. I'm gonna screen it. Honestly, the, the scene with Paul Reiser, we only, I think we shot that whole thing in an hour because Lisa Edelstein could only come out. It took an hour and wasn't it like an hour? We shot it like literally in an hour. Um, it was, I kind of gave them the beats of what they were going to say, like, you know, each moment that happens in that scene, but didn't obviously tell them exactly what to say. But yeah, I mean, it was improvised. I mean, it wasn't, when people think there's obviously like an entire sort of spectrum of what improvised means. There's like Joe Swanberg, for instance, his movies, his earlier movies, are just straight up. They don't even know what they're getting before they hit record. You know, and then there's like Robert Altman who would have a script and then throw it out the window and just be like, we're starting from scratch. You know, you guys know the story now, just talk. There's like Cassavetes who's just like, let's see actors just go on forever and not know when to cut. Like, there's just like a whole range of it. So this one I think is a little bit closer to a scriptment than just a straight up like, you know, uh, like a, a fest of people just kind of going off on tangents. So it was relatively structured, but we didn't have, this whole movie, we didn't have a lot of time is sort of the theme. And like, you know, we shot in 15 days, we were in another place. So like, it was like super rushed and, you know, it's just everyone showed up because they wanted to be a part of this and they're all cool, smart, fun people. But yeah, it wasn't like people were just like getting two, two days to kind of work on a scene, you know?
You have a question? Come on, come on. Uh, I really enjoyed the film. Uh, my name is Jacques Talaferro. I own La Hits Digital Media, and um, I'm really happy to be here. The, uh, the improv scenes I really liked, uh, being an actor, and also um, it really reminded me of a Robert Altman film, who I actually had a couple of classes with him when he taught at uh, Long Beach State. You, you, you studied State. with Robert Altman? Uh, yeah, he had a, well, he was a guest instructor, right. and he, he taught uh, uh, the class the, for the um, advanced film students there at Long Beach State. So I really liked it, and I also um, am a programmer for um, the Oakland International Film Festival and also the San Francisco Black Film Festival here. And we had two films that were Jewish, African American related. One was about the music industry, which I really encourage everybody to see uh, when it comes out. And um, hopefully you'll get the information through the uh, emails that we're gonna send to uh, the um, San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. So I really enjoyed the film, and you know, congratulations and good luck with it. Thank you. To answer his question. <laughs> All right, next question is to your left. Great film. Um, I wanted to ask, as you said that many parts were improvised, who inspired all the Jewish summer camp stuff? <laughs> Well, Blue Star is an actual camp in North Carolina. I grew up in Miami, and so a lot of kids from Miami that were Jews would go to Blue Star. And you know, you needed to have some kind of meet cute between uh, Pally and Jenny. And it just it seemed like, you know, the, you know, we were talking about this. At, we went to dinner earlier. Uh, full disclosure, and um, we were we were talking about like how this qualifies as a Jewish movie. Like, there's, I mean, other than that one line where uh, I think Pally goes, "It's uh, where the Jews are." Blue Star, where the Jews are, or whatever. Like, there's not really, yeah, and he's just a big soxy Jew, and he has, like, obviously an aleph, like a, he has a, was an aleph or something on his? Uh, it's like, Asher, that's what it says. Um, there's not, like, overt Judaism in this. Honestly, I don't remember where this question started off. Can you, I don't know, I went off on, oh, summer camp, yeah, so. So the idea was, like, to have, like, to basically take, like, upper middle class suburban Jewish kids who are obviously not like the biggest demographic in movies and make sort of this, I guess, dramatic, semi-comedic film based around that sort of socioeconomic group, which I'm familiar with, like I grew up that way, so like it's familiar to me. And um, yeah, so it just seemed like, a, like, there's like a thing with, I guess, Jewish people you grow up and you're always told like, other Jewish people, like you have this connection, it's so warm, like it's just whatever that is. So. It just seems like if you meet a girl and she's Jewish, there's also like tons of pressure because it's like, oh shit, like this might be my soulmate, I have to get married now. Like, so it just seemed like there was a, like it was kind of like a loaded um, thing, and it just would, I thought it'd be funny if it was like, oh my god, we went to the same camp, like we're destined to be together. Just, that's why. I have your next question to the far right. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your film. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the improvised nature of the performances, but the way that it's shot and captured seems very intentional and lovely. So can you just speak about your use of space when you were on set? Did that also just kind of come by the fly? or how much? In terms of plan? cinematography or blocking? Blocking, you know, everything that came together. In, in the yeah, I mean, so we, um, the, the way we would sort of shoot this is we would talk it out beforehand. We wouldn't do rehearsals because I feel, I personally don't like doing rehearsals unless you film them because I feel like it kind of kills the mojo. It's like you're kind of blowing your load a little bit. So we would kind of talk it out, figure out generally where people would be. And then we would, like I said, we would start rolling on the first like three or four takes and find the scene as it was happening. So we would come up, you know, we didn't have a lot of time, like I mentioned. So there's only a couple of shots that I'm actually proud of in this movie. You know, there's the one where it kind of zooms in through the window and you see Alex on the phone. There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to do that were on my shot list. We just couldn't do it. But um, yeah, we would just figure it out as it was happening, block it out, and then pretty much just lock it in, trying to use as much space as possible, trying to you know, not make the camera feel intrusive as if, you know, oh, they're doing this crazy camera movement, check it out. It should almost feel organic and you're, you know, you're moving at a pace where you're just kind of keeping up with the conversation. You're not too focused on, I guess, the, the cinema aspect of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, it was improvised, but it also, by the time we were onto like the fifth take, it was, it was as if you were doing a script. We just established a script as we were starting off. And then once we locked in, it was pretty much not robotic, but it was, it was pretty established. Next question's all the way in the back over here. Hey, um, so just going back to the topic of repressed emotions, I was wondering if you could talk about any conversations that were spurred among the actors or among you all 
about that topic during the process? Nobody What's wanted up? to talk about it. Yeah, we can't, we don't really feel comfortable talking about it. So, uh, Lauren Weedman, who played the prostitute, had a really interesting point when I, when I was talking to her about the part, which is that she um, had a, a really close girlfriend who was up in Seattle, who had just broken up with her girlfriend, and pretty much the entire group of friends, like, a, I don't know if it was like 25 women, just sort of amassed and assembled in, in Seattle and just were, were there with her for like a long weekend and just getting over what happened and just getting into it. And then there's, you know, so that's, I'm not trying to, uh, I mean, there's obviously like, there's gender fluidity and I don't want to be specific about anything, but there was that dynamic. And then in um, this situation that this is sort of based on, it was like 25 guys were invited and only three guys showed up and no one wanted to talk about it and they just wanted to do drugs and party and pretend like it didn't happen. So for me, it feels like a, guys aren't as articulate with their emotions as, although, as the, obviously they feel them, but guys for the most part aren't as articulate with their emotions. And so... You know, this movie is sort of like a projection of that, where, you know, even I'm sure when you came into this theater, you were expecting like a straight up fun comedy, and then it's just, it's a bummer a lot of times. And, you know, it's almost like the movie itself is an extension of that male mindset, where it's like every time it's sort of, we just want to keep the good times going, and it starts like careening off the road and starts getting into like heavy emotional shit, and then like we try to get it back on the road and we kind of feel good again. It seems like that's sort of a way that guys sort of deal with their emotions, and I think that's kind of fascinating. I have your next question here to the right. Hi, Jeff. So, and Mike. Um, Is that Tanya? Yeah. We grew up together. Yeah. I, you know, we grew up together and I, for, I you've always really had an, uh, an ear for music and I think we've had a lot of musical alignment together and I was totally stoked to hear a score from Devendra. And, I want you to talk about that for a little bit because I was trying to listen a little to the words and it sounds like some of it was in Hebrew and um, and I just, I want you to speak to your choice of music because it was very awesome, a couple of like great kind of 70s tunes and then, you know, classical and whatnot, so maybe Devendra and everything else. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it felt like this movie was was capturing a particular vibe of the time that this movie was being made. So, you know, there's like the vaping, and there's just sort of like a, a thing that's going on now that I kind of wanted to get into. The musical choice, the aesthetic of it was very specific. A lot of these tracks were in my temp that we ended up getting the rights to. Um, Devendra Banhart, I'm a tremendous fan of. Like, I've always loved his music. And it seemed to me like there's a, a you know, when you go to Ojai, it's kind of like a, it's not super... Hippie, it's, it's kind of crunchy, but it's also kind of witchy. It's got like a, a really interesting vibe to it. And for me, Devendra's music, even though he actually had never been to Ojai before this movie, um, there's, there's something that kind of felt sympathetic. And so I approached him and we got into it and he was super psyched to do it. And, um, you know, he had never done a score before. And I, I mean, this and Life After Beth, I also got Black Rebel Motorcycle Club to do it, which is a band who'd never done a score before. And I found something kind of rewarding about getting people who had never gone through this process before, who are kind of not, I guess, hacky when they're approaching scores, because there, there's some sort of shorthand stuff that composers tend to know that musicians don't know. For instance, that the music has to be in the background instead of in the foreground, in your face. And so there was like a tremendous learning curve both times to get these guys to kind of understand how you make your music sort of fit within a movie as opposed to being the featured thing that kind of exists in and of itself. Um, so, you know, I mean, the truth is I have so much original Devendra Banhart music that is so great. It just didn't work for this movie, but it's like absolutely beautiful stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely a difficult thing to tell someone like, dude, that is honestly like one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've ever heard in my life, but it just totally doesn't work in the scene. Can you try to do something else that's like equally as beautiful? You know, like that kind of stuff is like, it's very frustrating for everyone, but I think what he came up with is, it's so like, it's coming from a different place, so the movie, which was my intention, should hopefully feel like not like something you've seen or felt before, not that this is like breaking new ground, this isn't like, you know, crazy like astrophysics or something, but that it's, it's kind of a new combination of things that don't feel as sort of, I guess, uh, stayed. And so I think with Devendra, like that, it was just really, it was so cool. Like he's such a talent and I love him. Next question's on the left. Hi, I enjoyed it very much. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned about the, the lack of the male uh, communication in terms of being supportive, and it, usually the biggest danger was that they wouldn't be supportive, but 
then there was the scene where they left the prostitute in the bathroom when they knew the parents were walking in. And that seemed, was that like a metaphor for just how unsupportive they could be? Because it looked like they were going to get him framed. I wouldn't say that I was saying that they're not supportive. I would say they're just not articulate. So I mean, they articulate. are being, their version of being supportive is what they're doing. Like their idea of how you support your friend is make sure he has a good time. Like, you know, he's, he's been through a rough patch. Like the dude needs to just like chill out and relax, you know? So to me, I would disagree with the unsupportive part. And I would say that, you know, the, the prostitute being in the bathroom part was out of convenience because she was right there. No one knew that they were going to have this emotional breakdown like right then and there. It's just, you know, obviously miscommunication once again with what Kroll thinks is sort of appropriate for this kind of weekend versus what was actually happening. So it, was, it wasn't a metaphor, it was literal. I think we have time for one more question. I have your last question right here in the front. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I really, really like the movie. Um, the one part near the end where uh, they have the kiss at the door as uh, Jenny Slate's character is leaving. Um, when I was watching that, I kind of felt like it could kind of go either way. It was really on the fence, which was, made it kind of interesting. Um, was that set up beforehand, or did you allow the actors to decide on the spot and kind of improv? No, no, we knew. That was in the outline, but it was something we had talked about a lot. Jenny and I like got way into it because... I sort of felt like it, it showed some weakness on her part because the, the scene in the bar, for me, that was all about her not kind of letting him have his cake and eat it too, where you know, she, he's trying to break up with her but also somehow remain the nice guy. And the calculus doesn't quite add up. And you, know, in his, you can tell like, his motivation is to get her to accept that what, it, what happened was like, messed up, but she still does have a connection to him. And there's some like, cognitive dissonance going on there. So, you know, I, I did feel like it, it sets yourself up for the argument that Jenny is just like a weak character that's kind of, and, and so she, she and I like got way into it and her point was, this is a girl who's going through her 30th birthday, which is um, for, some, for some people just like a, you know, it's like a real milestone and you're kind of like, like, holy shit, what's happening in my life? And, you know, she kind of feels like she's like uh, in, a, in a weird place and she's meeting this guy and like, you know, maybe she hasn't had love in a while and this guy seems almost like he's like perfect and he's, cat, you know, he's on the level. And so, you know, like, why not? Like, people make mistakes. And, like, I think the whole movie ultimately is about a bunch of people kind of making mistakes a lot as opposed to making the right move. And so it felt kind of consistent with that. But it was definitely something we had talked about. But it wasn't something that was improvised. It was something that was um, always an intention. So before we go, um, I understand the film is being released. Maybe you can just tell people um, where they can see it or how they can uh, tell people about it. There's that one theater. You want to take this one, Zakin? Yeah, it comes out in New York and L.A. Um, and like eight other cities. Yeah, ten cities. Maybe here. I'm assuming if this is a top ten market, you guys are going to get it August 12th. You'll, you'll get it. Yeah, it's going to either be here August 12th or the following weekend, August 19th. Yeah, and uh, it will also be on VOD. I mean, like you guys already saw it, but it's going to be on VOD on the same day, August 12th. And then we did a really weird move uh, up in Sundance where Hulu got an exclusive right for the um, subscription-based release, so this will never be on Netflix. It's going to be, or maybe it will at some point, but it's going to be on Hulu in November, which they've never done before, so supposedly they're going to be like all amped up about that, but we'll see. Super amped up. Yeah. But thank you for coming. I hope you liked it. Thanks, everyone. We do have a reception upstairs, which you're welcome to join us in as well. Thank you.